Um, Robert, I'm amazed in the um, advocacy work that I do. As you know, I spend a lot of time talking about diverse managers and I'll, I'll at some point in the conversation bring up Vista and some smart associate on the opposing side, usually a consulting firm will say, well, what do you mean diverse manager Vista? What, what's diverse about Vista? And, and, and I kind of laugh because it, on some measure, it's a testament of the firm's success. But on the other hand, there's this notion that you cease to be an African-American when you become very wealthy and very successful. Uh, let me ask you the first question, and we're going to focus on being black in America, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first question is, as a child growing up in your neighborhood, how did you define success? That's a great question. And Bob, and I, I again, want to thank you for inviting me here, you know, you know, just for the audience. And, you know, thank you all for taking time to, to listen uh, to our conversation. Bob said, Robert, I'd like to have a conversation as if we're in the airport and, you know, just two friends talking. Bob and I have known each other, I guess, two decades uh, or so now. Uh, and I tease him. Everybody has always thought that I'm his younger brother, um, but uh, turns out I'm a couple years older than him. But, you know, um, we want to, I think, have a very open conversation here. Um, I grew up uh, in Denver, Colorado, in, in essence, at a time of really, you know, in a, in a segregated neighborhood, all black neighborhood. Um, and we were going through the stages of desegregation. It was my kindergarten class. Uh, uh, that actually, you know, was the first ones to to go through what, what we what they called forced busing uh, to desegregate the school system uh, in, in in Colorado. And I just remember, um, you know, all the, the the kids in my neighborhood, uh, many of who I'm, I'm whom I'm very close to still, uh, getting on this bus. Now, right before they started desegregating the schools, uh, there were some racists that decided that that was just the wrong thing and burned. Uh, about a third of the buses that were supposed to be used for this desegregation. And so rather than three buses coming to my neighborhood and carrying all the kids in my neighborhood uh, to the school across town, only one came. Uh, and it was interesting that there uh, only a select number of students who just happened to be in this three block radius uh, could actually get on that bus uh, and then go to the other side of town to uh, a much more resourced uh, school. Um, and so you were faced you know, as a child, you, you don't really know the difference until later and you reflect on it, uh, but you're, you're faced with the reality of, of, of people who are, you know, economically haves and economically have nots and, and how the discrimination plays out in, you know, the day-to-day -day existence. Uh, you know, it played out in things like, you know, in Denver, you know, when we used to have lots of snow in the wintertime, uh, all of our parents typically had to go to work and catch a bus or, or drive or whatever it might be. And, you know, our neighborhood would be the last one where we would get snowplow. And I remember my father taking that on as a challenge uh, to ensure that, you know, the, the, the parents in our neighborhood had the ability to actually get to work because, of course, you'd be, you know, you couldn't earn money or dock pay because you actually couldn't move because, you know, they'd come and plow our streets three days later. Mm -hmm. And so in growing up, you know, part of what in answering your questions, you know, how I defined success was, you know, like all things, we wanted to make our parents proud. We wanted to be able to, you know, not be a disappointment in their minds. And that meant to excel at school. Uh, and that meant to do your best in, if you were members of the Boy Scouts or, you know, catechism class or whatever it might be, or, you know, the Rocket Club that was, you know, hosted by uh, uh, a young man who wasn't getting paid at all to do it, uh, to teach some of us about rocketry at the time, uh, the age of rocketry in the, in the United States. Um, when it was new. Um, and, you know, that's what we focused on as kids. And we worked with each other. And I just remember coming home from on the bus and my parents weren't home and our neighbor, uh, she was a, a stay at home uh, uh, mother and she had three daughters and she would invite all of the kids into their home uh, until our parents came back and I was, you know, fed us, you know, nutritious snacks and the older kids would tutor the younger kids in math or English or science or whatever it might be. And I just remember that uh, experience of what defined success was the way that they gave uh, to other members of the community. And I always think about that, you know, frankly, daily. Uh, as an important part, don't be a disappointment to your parents or your your, your community and society. You know, it was those ages where, you know, if you're walking to the store and you threw a rock and it broke a window, you know, the neighbor would call your parents. First, they'd yell at you and then they'd call your parents. And it was that sort of a community. And so being a part of a community uh, and a contributor to com community was an important part of the success uh, that one thought about as a child. 
So that's fascinating to me because in so many ways, while the folks at Denver, I'm sure, um, consider you theirs, you, you belong to all of us now, right? That's that's a part of becoming, whether you accept it or not, a national and a global leader. But this notion of community started in a small place in Denver and the same lessons, the same responsibilities, the same ethos has now spread out globally. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing that piece. And I know that's going to be a piece that continues to, to go throughout this. Mm -hmm. so, so let's move forward now. Um, you matriculated to Cornell University. And obviously, you had a lot of success to, to find yourself at an Ivy League school. But then how did you define success when you got into Cornell and you were in college? Sure. Again, you know, the, the, the whole thought of being your best self, be, the, the thought of how to you know achieve and accomplish both of my parents, uh, you know, we're fortunate in that they earned uh, doctorates in education. You know, they were school teachers um, and, you know, principals and administrators. Uh, but the, the importance of, you know, the highest quality education, not only for them, but all the, the, the kids in our community was, was central and important. So when I had a chance uh, to go to a place like Cornell and Ivy League School, uh, it was critical uh, that, that I go and I work hard and, and, and I do my best and do well. Uh, but doing my best and doing well there uh, wasn't just in grades. It was also, you know, participate in the fabric of not only community life um, uh, at, at Cornell, but also in the Ithaca community. And so, you know, and, and I think, you know, this, Bob, I, I joined the greatest fraternity on the planet um, that was Alpha Phi Alpha, which was founded uh, at Cornell. Uh, and um, I know it, it's fortunate you're also a member of a, a great fraternity and, you know, uh, uh, which is exciting to see how uh, the sons of Alpha have done well. Um, I'm teasing Bob a bit, audience, but um, part of what we did at Cornell was to build out a number of community service programs, some of which still exist, you know, go, go to college programs and we, we literally get a bus load of, and van load of uh, Ithaca High School students and take them to HBCUs uh, during our spring break. We weren't fortunate enough to have money to go, go to the <laughs> Florida. But we literally go and we call the fraternity brothers along the East Coast from Morgan State to, to Howard, um, you know, Cheney State, et cetera, and, and would take these kids down and let them meet with the admissions officers and, you know, would stay in the fraternity, you know, uh, uh, brothers rooms and angels rooms and those sort of things. Uh, and that was very much a part of the college experience. We also created you know, scholarship programs that still exist. And I think one is yielding $80,000 a year for Cornell uh, African-American students, some we created 30 years ago. So part of success there was, again, contributing. And, and being part of the fabric of uh, that community. And, you know, I still see my fraternity brothers, uh, you know, contributing to that. And even in their locations, they call upon us to, you know, to support whatever the local activities are, even though we are in the, as a chapter are now spread out. That, that, that was critical that we all worked hard, delivered uh, what we thought was our, our best academic work, but what along, went along with that was service uh, and service to the community uh, that, we, that we were part of. Well, you know, Robert, I'm really sorry for what the brothers of Cap Alpha Psi did to you at Cornell. Uh, <laughs> we have all discussed it and we have great regard for you. And we're happy that 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 alternative choice of going Alpha uh, and, and, and the honor of pledging at the Alpha chapter was uh, was available to you. And, and look, man, we're sorry. Uh, <laughs> You know, you only come around once, but uh, not everybody can be uh, a noob. So 